Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is session 15, part 2 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, focusing this session on the feelings, emotions, and responses God has generally has towards sin itself, and has when his children choose to sincerely forgive and repent. This session was recorded on the 5th of June 2018 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. Right, so how God feels about collective human choice. So now we want to move on to, we've just discussed how God feels about us as a collective group. Now we want to talk about, obviously, humanity is making a lot of choices that you could call collective, as in the majority are making the same decisions mm. constantly mm. and are in agreement with each other about many decisions. Now, some of those decisions we could view as loving and some we could view as unloving. But we want to know really how God feels about these uh, things that we collectively do. Um, and a lot of people, again, feel that God doesn't have much regard for the situation that we find ourselves in as, as the human race. So yeah. does God have feelings and emotions about what we do? Or does God not care at all about our choices? And here we is meaning collect the collective. Yes. Yeah. So if you examine this particular subject, if we go back to the section that we just discussed uh, just previously, mm -hmm. which is this section about how God feels about humans collectively, mm -hmm. you can see that most of what applies there also applies to this particular discussion about what, how God cares about what we do. Because mm -hmm. obviously many of the things that we discussed in that previous discussion, such as laws yes. and so forth, all impact what we do. So obviously they God... They all respond to what we do as of well. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're obviously... Uh, it's obviously clear from that discussion that God must care about what we do collectively, mm -hmm. not just about us collectively. Mm -hmm. So he, 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 is concern, he concerns himself with what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and he is, in fact, many of the laws that govern the human soul demonstrate that concern for what we do yes. and not just who we are. Yes. So, so we need to keep that in mind. Yeah. But obviously, in this question, we want to sort of focus more of our attention on the choices we make collectively mm -hmm. and, and how God feels, what God's emotions are about the collective choices we make. Because obviously we're talking about this in the context of a series about forgiveness and repentance when all of that is exactly. based around choice. So yeah. you could say collectively, mm -hmm. from God's perspective, where, where there are certain things we are collectively going to have to forgive. Yes. And collectively, there are certain things we're going to have to repent for yeah. because we've all been involved in those particular things. Mm -hmm. And we all, we all need to come to understand how God feels about our collective choices here. But, but I suppose before we discuss how God feels about our collective choice, we need to understand mm -hmm. what God understands about choice. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that is quite clear too. Uh, God, God understands that the collective belief systems in agreement are what chooses, you know, so in agreement or in conflict, yeah. the, the collective um, belief systems mm -hmm. that are either in agreement or in conflict with, with God's, God's laws, laws yes. are going to determine to a great degree the effects of our choices, right? So, mm -hmm. so You mean it's going to affect the choices we make? And also the effect of the choices that we make. <laughs> yeah. Both. Okay. Yeah. It affects yeah. the choices we make and the effect of the choices yes. we make. Yeah. <laughs> so, so collective belief systems uh, are, are a very big, have a very big impact. So when yeah. we say collective belief systems, what we're talking about here is what the majority of humanity believes. So, so it'd be accurate to say right at this stage, the majority of humanity believes that death is a bad thing, right? Yep, to be avoided at to all costs. To be cost. avoided at all costs, even at the cost the of somebody of else's life, if you, yep. you, you, you yep. know, which doesn't make much logical sense. No. But, but, you know, that's what my majority of humanity do believe. Mm. Mm. And, you know, even those who are so-called religious, like Christian or Muslim, they believe that because they go to war. You know, mm. the reality is if you didn't believe that, you wouldn't go to war. So, you know, obviously you believe it mm. if you're going to war. So, so this is an indication of a collective belief system, in this case, uh, going to war, out of harmony with God's uh, 
laws mm -hmm. and uh, and that obviously is going to have certain results collectively it's yeah. going to cause uh, harm and suffering to more than one person mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's a collective experience collectively engaged and collectively co believed and choices are made that affect whole populations that's right based on, of course because the populations agree and the leaders agree they all have a collective belief system around it exactly yeah. exactly yep. another similar one of those is like fear fear is a mm -hmm. collective belief like there is a collective belief on this planet that fear is a real thing and it's something that we must all be concerned about yeah and and we must all act upon yeah and we must always try to prevent it uh, even if that means creating fear in other people, yeah. which again doesn't make much logical sense. Mm -hmm. but, but it is a collective belief. It's a false one out of harmony with God's principles and laws, mm -hmm. and therefore it's going to create a huge amount of pain and suffering. So these collective belief systems are going to, they're our choices, our collective choices that we're making. They drive our choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we need to understand that collective belief systems d drive collective choices. Yeah. Yeah. We also need to understand that collective emotional conditions drive mm -hmm. collective choices. Mm -hmm. And emotional conditions are things like how you feel about love. Well, the average person on this planet has a very love-hate relationship with love. Yes. <laughs> on one hand, they talk about love. On the other hand, they hate it. You know? yeah. And most, in fact, many people on the planet are in a deep level of resistance to love. You mm -hmm. know, they, they don't like to be loved. They don't want to take the risk of love. They feel they've been hurt by love in the past mm -hmm. and so forth. And there's a, so there's a lot of very confused emotions surrounding yes. love. And this causes people to act very uh, collectively, act yeah. very strangely when it yeah. comes to certain situations. So for example, collectively, most people say they want peace. Mm -hmm. But if somebody, you know, comes and harms their country, mm -hmm. now they don't want peace, yeah. you know. So, so, you know, these collective uh, emotional conditions drive yeah. a lot of their actions too, yeah. in or out of harmony with God's laws. Yes. And, so, and the third thing that God knows is that all of these collective systems, the belief systems and the emotional systems, come from the amalgamation of individuals yes. having those same belief and emotional conditions. So God knows that the problem with the collective is that if individuals don't change, yes. the collective condition cannot change. Yeah. So he knows that too. Yes. So when it comes to collective choice, he doesn't necessarily see it as a collective choice anymore. No. Because, because he knows that all collective choice are, it, choices are a sum total of the individual choices involved. Yes. And it's just unfortunate for the majority of us that we have individual choices that are in agreement that cause destructive behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he knows that and understands that. It's very important for us to get that in this mm -hmm. discussion, mm -hmm. because if we don't understand that in the discussion, when we talk about the collective, we're also not seeing the impact upon the individual. Yeah. Right. We yeah. sort of, what we have a tendency to do as humanity is we have a tendency to say, oh, that's happening over there. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. You know, things that I see, things that happen elsewhere, things that may affect me in the long run, mm -hmm. all have nothing to do with me because, I, you know, I don't want to change my choices. Mm -hmm. So they have nothing to do with me. Yeah. And this is a very stupid and also irrational way yes. of treating problems on the planet. So you're speaking there sort of like where we bemoan the state of society or the governance that's affecting our society but we don't actually own that as an individual i'm making choices that contribute to a collective situation that's right uh, whether that choice be avoid confrontation or avoid standing up for what is right or yeah. avoid standing up for what is moral or just because you like your addictions being met or whatever the reasons are yeah uh, where we we constantly deny the fact that our particular emotional and belief problematic belief systems are a major cause of the world's collective belief systems and problematic emotions. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we need to start seeing it as an individual problem rather than mm -hmm. collective one. So we need to bear that in mind in this discussion about how God feels yeah. about humans collectively, yeah. because, it, because he, he doesn't sort of get everybody together and say, what, you're all bad because, you know, you all think this way. Yeah. He, he, under, he, he sees it all as a sum total of the individuals, which yes. he personally assesses. Yeah, so really you're saying that God doesn't really ever... Um, the collective conditions that we find ourselves in on earth or in a society or whatever, um, God 
is God and God's laws are really making assessments based on every single individual within that collective and those individual operations create a collective environment Mm. rather than just saying, you mob, you all think the same way, so I'm just going to do this big thing. No, it's just an individual process. Yes. Yes. A process of individual correction. So then in this, we're talking here about how God feels about collective choice. Really, you're saying God doesn't see collective choice. Well, that's not true either, because he does see collective choice. He, he sees that we all have the same way of thinking on certain issues yeah. and therefore take a similar action or we agree with the actions taken on those issues. But God doesn't sort of, uh, God and God's creation and God's laws d- doesn't really operate on a collective. No, they do. They, they do. do. Well, they do assess the collective as a part of our individual choice. So it's sort how of like, does that work? Yeah. well, how that works is that God makes us all personally responsible for our individual contribution to the collective. Yes. So absolutely. each of us are individually contributing to the collective decisions so, and belief systems. So you're saying like there might be a, a phenomenon in society and some people are quite aggressive. Such as war. Let's uh, say such, as war. such as war, as yeah. an example. So some people are quite aggressive in saying, I want this to happen. This is I'm, I'm driving this decision. Other people might be quite afraid of those people, and so so they don't actively say, "I want this to happen," but they say, "I don't want to I'll confront. Let I'll let it happen because I don't want to confront those other That's people." That's right. I won't go to jail if I if by by refusing to make, ha, participate. So then the collective thing that happens is we all go to war, but you're saying that God assesses the aggressor and the the fear-based person for want of a better description in a different way correct yeah but he, ma- but he makes us personally responsible for the fact that we contributed to the war to the war because the it, collective because we event. are yeah you know the a person in fear contributes to a war as much as a person in aggression does yes you know that that's the reality yeah so god assesses these particular contributions that a person makes and, and an individual could say, I'm not going to war and I'd rather go to jail yeah. or I'd rather even die yeah. rather than go to war. And God will also assess that individual as not a part of the collective contribution. Yeah. So, so God assesses us individually, but it does make us responsible for our p- contribution to the collective decision. Yes. And this is what we must see, you know, yes. that, that's a part of God's laws. Yes. And so, but there we're talking about the laws. We want to get back to God's feelings. So how does God feel about collective decisions um, when we choose in harmony with love as a collective group? Yeah, so uh, obviously God loves all of his children mm-hmm. collectively mm-hmm. and God also, and, and also individually. Mm-hmm. God also wants, God, God, God wants to share God's truth with all of his children collectively as well as individually. So the, the, re- the reality is what we're going to say here applies individually as well as collectively. Mm. But, But to ensure that the human condition is self-determinant and self-responsible, God must allow the outcome of our choices to be fully felt by each person individually and the society collectively. Mm -hmm. Because if if God removes from us the results of our choices, individually or collectively, Mm -hmm. then basically what he's saying is you can get away with that particular choice and I'll rub, uh, I'll, I'll rub out the effects of what you created. He's mm-hmm. trying to take, he'd be trying to take away the results of our own creations, and he's not going to do that. Mm. So, so in the case of happy choices that we make, right, that is great because God's basically saying, I'm going to support these happy choices that you make. When you say happy, you mean loving. Loving, yep. loving choices yep. that you make that yep. create happiness. So I'm going to support those particular choices that you make. And every person who individually supports those particular choices, I'm also going to support. When it comes to the opposite, where we're making unloving choices and decisions, God's basically saying, no, you made the unloving choice and decision. You individually, if you made that choice and decision Mm. or you participated in it, you are part of this creation. Mm. The result might be war. You're a part of it. You know, whether it was fear that you inside of you that caused it or aggression, you're a part of it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's only when you refuse to participate at all that you weren't a part of it, right? Yeah. So if you're a part of it, God will make you a part of it mm-hmm. and make you responsible for being a part of it. Yeah. And he's not going to take away that responsibility 
and take away the pain and suffering that results from you mm. if you are a part of it. Yep. it. It makes sense, of course, that God's not going to do that. Of course. Because, because if he did do that, he would actually be negating the operation of his laws to correct us. <laughs> and, and that would be a silly thing to do on God's part. So yep. he's not going to do that. So we need, need to understand that God feels joy ha and happiness when we take loving actions. Yes. And God feels unhappy with us in the sense of not uh, unhappy is probably not the right word, yep. but, but he, he does not agree. Yes. With our choices and decisions that create unhappiness. Yeah. Does not agree with them all and he, and he's in strong disagreement with them and he will do everything he can to resist them. Yes. <laughs> everything he can without punishing us, without going into a place of anger, like, resentment, just trying to destroy yeah. us or anger yeah. of resentment, of course. Because yeah. God doesn't have those feelings because yeah. God lets himself feel the feelings about yeah. his feelings about what we choose to do. You know? Yes. So, so there's more to talk about, but... I think that uh, I'll talk about it in the individual choices because we're going to talk about that. Well, next. but there's still more here that God shares, yes, you know, you know, under this section that God shares the joy, happiness and contentment that his children experience when they choose in harmony with God's laws. And then we need to look at what God does not share <laughs> yeah. as well as a part of that. So maybe we need to just read out that section and then look at it in a bit more detail to see how God feels about our collective choices. Yes, because we, we're sort of talking about God's feelings here, but we're also, it's mixed in with that, we're talking about God's actions and responses and God's attitudes, aren't we? Um, well, God's feelings are God's attitudes. The actions and responses are already determined by God's laws. So God personally does not need to take actions and responses yes. because the laws already take actions and responses. So this, this stuff we're talking about here, that to ensure the human condition is self-determined and self-responsible, God must allow humans to make choices and to experience the full and complete results of those choices. That's really a law operation here. We're not talking about God's personal emotions. Well, it is about God's personal that emotions. God's personal emotions have governed the creation of the law. Correct. The, yep. the, so this tells us about God's emotions. Yes. God wants us and God feels that we must be, and he is immovable on this subject, yes. that we must be completely responsible for every choice and decision we make. Yes. And, and he is going to make us personally yes. responsible for every choice and decision we make. And he's not going to be negotiable. Yeah. He's, he's not a negotiator. Yes. Right? Yeah, they are. He, so, so it's sort of like a loving, immovable being. <laughs> yeah. He, he's drawn the line in the sand and said, you can go this far, but you go no farther. Yes. That's how, that's how he sees things. And he, you cannot negotiate with him. You can't rile, rile against him or pander to him or bribe him to go any further. Mm. And that's the way it is. You might be able to do that with humans, but you're not going to be able to do that with God. He yeah. is immovable on these particular subjects. And the laws demonstrate his feelings. His feeling is, I am immovable <laughs> on this subject. I am not going to let you get away with this. <laughs> you seem a little bit angry when you well, say that. But, well, but no, it's not an angry, it's not an angry statement. No. It's like, I am not going to let you get away with this bad behavior. Yeah. I am it's not firm, going to. Uh, and I am going yeah. to reward yeah. good behavior. Yes. I am going to. Yes. That's what I am. Yeah. So it's almost a, it's almost a statement goes through the law making a statement about his feelings. Yes. His feelings are when you make unloving choices that damage other parts of his creation, he is immovable on the matter. Yeah. Right? He's not going to move from that point. Yeah. He is as rigid as a rock on mm -hmm. that point, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He's not going to move any further. And we need to understand that, yeah. that, that, that this is how God feels about things that we do that are harmful. Yeah. And when it comes to things that, are, that we do that, are, that are ha create happiness, mm -hmm. he, he is just as generous, Yes. right? In the sense that he's going, I, he will do whatever he can Mm -hmm. to support uh, and, and enhance our experience mm. and oftentimes enhances our experience far beyond our capacity to even understand. Yeah. Right. That's how he feels about that. And so that tells us his feelings there. You do the right thing. And not, I am so overjoyed by it that I'm going to try and help you do it. I'm going to help you do everything you can to support that decision. I, my laws are going to help you do everything to support the decision. And mm -hmm. the joy I experience from you making that collective choice also is, you know, God obviously experiences the joy of that too. So God shares in our joy and happiness. Is that, is that a fair statement? Um, it would be probably more accurate to say God experiences it as an enhanced joy when he sees his creations in an enhanced state of joy. Mm -hmm. yep. 
So it's not so really he doesn't a suck, sharing he of doesn't our suck feelings. Yes. Our joy out of us. He he experiences more of his personal joy because of our joy. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Mm. Okay. Well, let's just cover the final points that we had in mm. answer to this question. Again, we're talking about how God feels collectively mm -hmm. about God feels about our collective choices. God does not share pain and suffering that his children experience when they choose in disharmony with God's laws, but has compassion for the choices made and is still very happy that his children are allowed to make choices, even if those choices are self-destructive. Mm. So that's, a, that's sort of uh, highlighting how much God enjoys us having this gift of free will. Yes, he's happy to see us make choices that are even self-destructive in, mm -hmm. in a way because mm -hmm. he goes, wow, if I didn't create this beautiful human, they wouldn't even have the capacity to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so it is a remarkable capacity that he put into the human. And is it fair to say, well, I think it's fair to say that the, our capacity to make choices and then experience consequences is a part of how we grow towards love and without the choices we would be severely limited in learning. Yes, and I find it quite remarkable that most humans are upset about that because because we're not upset about it on the physical level. You know, like, for example, there are limitations to our human body. Mm -hmm. When we touch a hot stove and get burnt, we, we don't complain about the law mm. because there's a law in operation there that, our, you know, touching a hot stove, a hot stove exceeds the design specification of the human skin yes. and so forth, starts to burn us. The sensory apparatus in our, in, 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 you know, our nervous system helps to see that actually if you keep your hand there, it's going to be worse for you. So that helps you to remove your hand mm -hmm. so, so it doesn't go you know, even into an even more destructive problem. Mm -hmm. and, and this is actually a good thing and we see it as a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I can't understand why we don't see it as a good thing emotionally. Mm. But, but obviously, we, because of our emotions, we have all sorts of different feelings about our emotions than we do about our sensory apparatus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but God does it. You know, mm. God feels the same way about us emotionally as he does about our sensory apparatus. He has limitations placed on the design for our own good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we need to feel the results of them That's yeah. in order to progress. That's yeah. how he sees it. Now... He doesn't share in the pain and suffering in the sense that if humanity is in pain and suffering, he is in pain and suffering. Mm. That's not the way God is. He's still very happy that he created humanity in the manner that he did, that humanity can create their own pain and suffering if mm -hmm. that's what they desire to do. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most people on earth do have a very strong desire to do that. You know, yeah. we, we do have a tendency, uh, not designed, but because of emotional injuries and, and choices we're making, we have a tendency to to self be self-destructive but even there god was loving enough to put limitations to how far we can go with that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we can't actually kill the soul mm -hmm. and we can't actually kill the spirit body either mm -hmm. so so there's great limitations that god placed upon that mm -hmm. but by allowing us to kill the body he's also shown us what he feels about it mm -hmm. that that self-destruction is a problem that we need to cure the desire to self-destruct yeah yeah there's a problem we yeah. need to cure so you know, he's also placed, you know, demonstrated by the death of the body that, you know, this should be demonstrating to us that God views life as important and important enough for us to, to have the first experience of dying so that we can correct it mm. in a later experience, in the later experience. Mm. 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 Okay. Um, so we've now covered a lot of this. God will not rescue humans from their collective self-destructive choices. Yeah, so again, line in the sand. I am not going to go any further than this. I am not going to step in and, and change what you created. You are going to have to destroy your own creations. All of my laws are doing everything they possibly can to destroy your creations out of harmony with love. But you are going to have to take steps yourself to destroy what the cause of them were, which, mm. are, which is inside you. And God does nothing to address what's inside of you there unless you are wanting God to be involved. So. Let's then use an example of um, the collective choice, say in Australia, um, to wholesale farmland to the to the point where to the point of environmental destruction. Yep. Yep. Clear and farm and clear and farm. Um, now that's a collective choice that's been made by generations past and the current generation and the current, mm. um, but. 
there's a situation I guess I'm getting at where generations are incarnating, inheriting the consequences of collective collective choices, and really, um, unless they take actions to reverse those collective choices as a collective themselves. I guess I'm, I'm asking about the responsibility for collective choices. Look, the way God's designed it is this. If, if, we, are, if we can't care for our children enough to preserve their environment, mm. who, are, who are we going to care for enough? Mm. Like, the reality is if you don't care for your own children enough to care for their environment, then you obviously are a very selfish person and mm. you don't really care for anybody. Mm. And it's highly unlikely that anything is going to make, motivate you to care for anybody. Mm. It's, it's interesting because, you know, there's data that's been produced recently that demonstrates how destructive uh, meat eating and, mm. you know, any, anything other than a ve vegan diet is to, mm -hmm. the, to the environment. And almost everybody, without exception, who reads the data says, oh, yeah, this data is compelling, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Yeah. So it's not compelling. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> if it was compelling, they'd do something about yeah. it, right? So they say it's compelling, but they're not going to do anything about yeah. it. How, it's solid data. It's, it's, scientific, it's solid yeah. scientific data. Yeah. They're not going to do anything about it. They made a choice to not do anything about it, even for the sake of their own children. They're not going to do anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. we'll, you know, their idea is we'll come up with another solution. But scientists are already saying, no, this solution is, is the worst possible thing you can do. Yeah. You need to do something different. And this yeah. is the most rapid solution to improve the environment. And yet nobody's doing anything about it or very few people are doing anything about it. Why? Because they don't care enough for their own children to mm. do anything about it. Mm. Now, now, God's, now, if, if, you, if it's, it's, it, it makes sense that the next generation of children need to have the result of our bad decisions mm -hmm. in order for them to at least go, now hang on a sec, even though you didn't care for us, we are going to care for ourselves mm. enough to do something about this. To make a different collective choice. To make a choice. different collective choice. Yeah. And if that never happened, the next generation would never make a different collective choice. Yes. So, so this is how like the women suffrag suffragette movement, yep. you know, caused the change in the political structure of most Western societies mm -hmm. uh, by the next generation of women making this collective choice. No, we're not going to put up with the fact that yes. we're treated like second class citizens anymore. Yes. We're going to do something about this. We're, you know, in our homes as well as in our yes. lives, as well as in, in politics, you know. Yeah. And without the next generation making that choice, feeling the consequences of the free previous generation's choice, it's highly unlikely the next generation will make a different choice. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you can understand why God made this collective system yes. uh, apply, because without it, a lot of big changes in, in, in society would never happen. Mm. 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 Okay, good. Yep. Okay, God desires that humans come to an agreement that their choices have been destructive and also come to an agreement that they need to individually change in order to create a happier collective existence. Yes. Which is a lot of what you've just been discussing. Isn't exactly. It? And I think we need to add to the individual change the mm -hmm. fact that they need to share that individual change. It's no good just you making an individual change without speaking up about the change that is necessary. Yeah. So, so here, you and I, the example, you and I have been vegans for like, I don't know, 14, 15 years or whatever. Um, well, most, I've been a vegetarian most of, most life, of my life, right? Yeah. So uh, for me, f 15 years. Yeah. Um, so, so I made a click, my personal change. Yeah. If I never spoke about that personal change, mm -hmm. then how can I impact collective change? Yeah. I can't. So yeah. I need to be brave enough to stand up and say, no, collective change is also necessary on this subject, mm -hmm. besides my personal change. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. And it's not a judgment of the collective. It's just no. a statement of fact. Yeah. If we do not collectively change, the scientific data suggests that within a generation, we won't even have enough places to have any food, let yeah. alone, you know, yeah. meat eaters, <laughs> meat eating. You'd be yeah. worried about starving to death rather than worried about where's your next meat meal coming mm -hmm. from. And, and this is actually, you know, scientifically proven. Yeah. So, so, so what are we going to do about it collectively? Mm -hmm. Now, you can individually do something about it, and then you can also be brave enough to take the next step, which is to share Yes. And this is a responsibility yes. that God places upon us collectively as well. This is how God feels about collective choices. 
that we as individuals, when we make a change decision, we also need to take, make a decision to try to or attempt to influence in a loving way the collective. Yeah. Not, not be destructive about it mm. because there's many vegans that are what I'd classify as militant and, and very abusive. Destructive. Yeah, abusive. Mm. They just become abusers of mm. other people. That's not what God's saying here. You mm. just need to stand up for what is right, share the truth of what is right and so forth. Yeah. That's all you need to do. Yeah. And, and if you don't do that, then yeah. you are still participating, even though you've stopped the personal action. Yeah. You are still participating in the collective by not yes. speaking up. Yes. And, and so this is what we also need to see. And so we could say the same thing for collective uh, education system, except parenting style. Science, uh, collective science. Attitudes to politicians. health and mental health. Yeah. Uh, Every aspect of life. Personal relationships. Yeah. 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 And this is what we notice a lot uh, happens with a lot of people who listen to Divine Truth. They listen. They might attempt to make some personal change, although sometimes that's very insincere. Mm -hmm. But it's very rare for them to attempt to help collective change. Yeah. You know, there are some brave individuals who do, mm -hmm. but it's a very rare thing. Mm -hmm. It needs to happen more because yeah. a person who sincerely, personally has changed has a responsibility yeah. to lovingly help the rest of society make that same choice. Yes. And, and this is an expectation that God has of the collective. Right? Mm. So this is one of the things oh. about how God feels about collective decisions. Yes. We are individually responsible for helping the collective decision change. Yes. And this is something that we need to come to terms with. Yeah. Mm. Very important, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Lovely. So we, in summary, we've said that God feels joy and happiness and contentment when we, um, as a collective, make loving choices. Yeah. And, and God feels wonderful that because we naturally feel happier as a collective when we make those loving choices. God also feels great about that. Um, but God feels firm when we as a collective don't make loving choices and God feels firm about our individual responsibility within the collective. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and we could say here we are talking here specifically about how God feels about choices. Mm -hmm. Whereas before we were talking about how God feels about us generally. Just as beings as who exist. That's right. Entities, now, yeah. now we're talking about how he feels about our choices. And we yeah. can see here that God is far more concerned, in fact, if, about our choices mm -hmm. than he is about how he feels about us collectively. His collective feelings about us are just all loving. Yeah. Uh, like, everything's like God just has uh, uh, all these wonderful feelings about collective an abundance provision of feeling and um, yeah. opportunity and potential. Yes, yeah. but when it comes to our collective decisions, you could say that God's feelings are not always um, like, in a, they're never or rarely in agreement with our decisions. Mm. And, and therefore, he will let us know that, he, that it's of a distaste to him. Mm -hmm. like, so, so, when he, so while he personally doesn't feel any uh, negative emotions yeah. on his own for his own self. Yes. He certainly can feel for that, that we are making terrible choices that we need to correct. Yes. And he certainly, and although he has compassion for the fact that yeah. we make these bad choices and experience all the pain and suffering, he, he actually does disagree mm. with our choices and is trying and doing everything he can to oppose them, in fact, and destroy them. Mm -hmm. And his laws have been specifically created to destroy our bad choices mm. and, and to correct them. Mm. And this demonstrates God's feelings about our bad choices. He doesn't feel very good about those bad choices we're <laughs> making. He would love us to make some different choices. Yeah. And he disagrees with them intensely, passionately. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's, and this is why when people say to me, oh, you're getting pretty passionate or fired up about you know, this particular bad thing that's happening, of course I am. That's yeah. how God gets. He's real <laughs> passionate and fired up about the fact that you want to hurt somebody. Mm. He's real passionate and fired up about the fact that you want to make some decisions and choices that are out of harmony with love. Yes. Yeah, so even though God's compassionate and loving and has a lot of joy when we make loving choices, God isn't wishy-washy in any feeling. So <sighs> when when we make an unloving choice, God is very firm yeah. without being angry or resentful yeah, there's a real, or there's punishing. A real, uh, you know, in the New Age movement and a lot of the Buddhism and Hinduism philosophies, there's this real uh, religious viewpoint that, you know, God's just some laid back individual and he doesn't really care what choices we make. That, nothing can be further than the truth. Deta not detached. He's not detached yeah. from our choices. He, he wants us to make loving choices and he's passionately opposing any mm -hmm. unloving choice we mm -hmm. make. 
but he, he doesn't do it in a way that's destructive or angry with us. He's not, he's not trying to uh, harm us or destroy us or denigrate us while he's passionately opposing us. Mm -hmm. He is just passionate in his opposition that, no, this is the wrong thing and you should not be doing it. Yeah. And if you had any connection with your conscience, you would feel that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like pretty strong <laughs> from God. Yeah. When you start, when you have a conscience connection and you start to do something that's wrong, yes, you, 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 you get a pretty strong message from God. Uh, you're all wrong now and, not, <laughs> and I'm pretty passionate about the fact you're wrong, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So um, God, God's not this lukewarm, you know, yeah. being who just lays back and goes, oh, I just made it. Eventually everything will come good. You know, it's mm. not like that. He's, he's actively interested in yes. making sure that society on the planet and in the spirit world gets better as soon as it possibly can yeah not for any other reason than we will all be happier the sooner yeah 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 makes sense god is passionate not dispassionate god is very passionate yes about all matters yes about yeah. all matters and particularly uh you know you could say about matters that uh, affect the joy and happiness of of the human mm. You know, obviously that that is a, uh, that is what God has the strongest connection to, mm -hmm. because as we've just seen in our previous discussion, everything in the universe was designed for the happiness of the human. So yeah. God is extremely concerned yes. about the happiness of the human. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, yeah. you definitely can't say that God just sits back and goes, "Oh, you want to be unhappy? That's fine." He, yeah. God always is trying to do something to ensure that you want to be happy and yeah. to take steps towards that. Yes, mm. yeah. Lovely. <laughs> how God feels about humans individually. So we've spoken now at length about how God feels about us collectively. Let's now take a look at God's personal interest in us. Mm. Because a lot of people feel that God isn't, even if they feel God's kind of collectively interested, and a lot of people are sort of more open to the idea that God has laws. Okay, if God exists, then it makes sense. God has laws that govern us, and there's sort of a kind of a collective care for how things operate. But often there's a resistance emotionally to feeling that God actually individually feels things for us. Um, yeah, that he cares for me. Yes, me as a person. Yeah, and he cares yeah. about my life and what how I'm doing and mm. decisions I make and, and the pain and suffering I'm experiencing and so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah. So how does God feel about us as individuals or feel about me as an individual? Well, let's look at the evidence again. Mm -hmm. like we need to look at the evidence of how God feels about us as individuals. You know, yeah. and, and if we look at the evidence, then maybe we'll start to have some kind of concept. Of course, we're here again, we must say that if you connect to God via the conscience and, and in terms of the love connection with God, you will experience how God feels about you as an individual. So that, that will help solidify, uh, you know, the truth of what we're saying to you here. So this discussion is almost again for people who have not yet decided to do that and, and, have, and instead of uh, have some bad feelings about themselves or bad feelings about God that prevent that from happening. And, and so they have to be, it has, some logic has to be shared with them about how God actually feels about them personally. Mm -hmm. But if you could actually feel how God feels about you personally, you probably wouldn't need to ask the question, right? Yeah. So this is an yeah. important thing to realise. But All right. So let's look at the evidence. Sure. Mm. So the evidence is God created us with an individual personality and nature. Now, you know, God didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the fact that God took enough care to make sure that every soul, and then we here we're talking about the complete soul, that every soul and it's two halves, obviously, so two halves make the whole. Every soul has a unique, identifiably unique personality in nature. Mm. Now, that meant that God had designed each soul individually. Mm. He, he, he didn't just go, he just go, and I create a thousand souls. It's, mm. like, it's like creating a thousand ants, mm. right? It's not like that. They're all the same. They mm. all do the same. They all, you know, act the same. They all act in a group mentality. That's not how he designed the human soul. Mm. So, so, so that indicates that he is very important to him, God, to God. Mm. The individual is of supreme importance as yes. well, yes. right? And, and the individual is what he wants the relationship with. Yes. Right? He wants an individual relationship with the child. He doesn't want a collective relationship with the group. Yeah. He wants an individual relationship with you. Yes. So, so, so let's say there's 20 people in a room and they walk into the room. He doesn't want the 20 people just to like him. 
Mm. He wants to know each individual in that room, yeah. the 20 people in the room. He wants to have personal communication mm -hmm. with each individual in the room. Mm -hmm. He wants to actually know the feelings and feel the feelings of each individual in the room. Well, God already knows us, doesn't he? It's just that God wants us to want to share us, share ourselves with God. Is yeah, that it's one thing to say God wants us, God already knows us. That, yeah. that, that can be sometimes quite dismissive. Mm. The, the reality is he knows us because he wants to know us individually. Yeah. And also he knows us because he created us as individuals. That's yes. why he knows us. Yeah. It's not because he, he, he just... Um, you know, decided that all people be the same and therefore he knows everyone the same. Mm. It, it's, he created us with individual personality and an individual nature so he can walk in the room and know us because he created even what's in us, mm. right? He, he did not create our experience. We do that. Yeah. And he wants to know our experience. Mm. He, he is happy to converse with us about our experience. Yes, right. and he has responses to our experience, which is different to the nature and personality that he created. Yes, right. because there's this there's this thing, isn't there, where God is on, omnipotent. So God actually knows, as I'm having my experience, God kind of knows my experience. Of course, but he feels your experience. But there's a distinction there that that creates a personal relationship, which is me wishing to share that experience with God and hear from God about that experience as it's occurring. Yeah, well, in some ways, we're automatically sharing the experience with God because God's, God already knows. God already wants to know the experience. So God's mm -hmm. observing the experience. God's absorbing your experience. Yeah. God will know, feels about your experience already. He already does all that for yeah. you, whether you know about that or not. Yeah. It's, it's by you becoming conscious of that, mm -hmm. now there's a greater joy in God about that because mm. now God's having this individual experience with you. Right. So there's an awareness of the relationship on that, your part, on my part, and God that feels God an enjoys. Enhanced, yeah, joy about that. Which, yes. that's incredible, isn't it? It is because it's it's an extension of the fact that God already is interested. He's already mm. knows what you're doing. He mm. knows what you're feeling. He knows your experience. He knows all your hardships. He knows all your problems, and he knows all the, the solutions to every one of your problems as well. Mm. He knows what you need to feel and what you need to go through in order to correct all of these things. And in, in fact, he's doing his best through the operation of his laws and through the personal direction of his of, of spirits who are his helpers to help you go through those experiences. He's doing everything he can possibly do, mm. but he's waiting for your personal engagement of that relationship. Mm. Right? The fact that he's waiting for that is an indication of how much he loves the individual. It is, and it's very moving for me because I often think my experience, man, you you want to, you want me to share this with you, you know, it, it, the fact that God would have more joy just because I, as an individual, want to have a relationship with God and sort of share my experience. Yeah, I don't know. It's not that strange if you think about it from a parental perspective. If you think you've got a child, example. And you imagine you've got a child and you can see everything he's doing and you know everything he's doing and you know his personality and his nature and you're seeing every choice he makes and everything, but he just doesn't talk to you. Mm. Right? Is that going to be better or worse than him than still knowing all those things, but now he talks to you? Mm. Now, now he shares himself with you. Now he wants to know you. What's going to be better? Mm. Now, from God's perspective, that the second option is the best option. That's what he's always trying to trigger and cause in us. Mm -hmm. The desire to know him, to share in this conversive relationship, this this personal relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And and while God knows everything about us already, he knows that we don't know everything about us. And he knows that he can help us with that. Mm -hmm. And he knows that there's a way that, that he's doing the best he can to help us with that. Mm -hmm. But he can help us better if we ask and mm -hmm. we desire and we share in a relationship with him, he can help us far better then than he could just by observing and having laws and having spirit friends help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is a complete demonstration of God's individual care for us and also his individual joy about having the relationship with us on return to him. Yes. Uh, you know, he, he there's we don't understand that God, by giving us this capacity to have free will, He's also given us the capacity to give him a gift that he doesn't have. Mm. And that's the gift of our love. Mm. He, 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 get, he gets to feel the gift of our love when we choose to give it. Mm. That enhances God's joy. Yeah. Every new child that experiences 
the openness to then giving the gift of love to God, mm -hmm. of the love of the individual to God, God then experiences a new joy. Mm. Uh, so it's very, very important to God that, that this love-based relationship is established on the part of the child. From God's perspective, it's already existing, mm. but, but, and it's always going to be. But, but when the child does it, it's like coming home to God, like it, God, God treats it very, very differently mm. and, and feels very strongly about it, you know, emotionally strongly about it. So much so that if you could feel God's feelings about it, each new child that comes to God may, almost make you cry, you know, that's mm. how you feel in joy, you know, that the new person has come. And, and this is sort of how God is. God has passionate about experiencing the relationship with each one of his children. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. Okay. God designed the human soul with its two halves to be complete within itself and not need anything other than uh, itself in order to be completely happy. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is an important part too, is that he didn't say, look, you're going to need me in the end in order to be, to have a complete experience, you know, mm. as a perfect natural man. Mm. He, he didn't say that, you mm. know, he, he could have, you mm -hmm. know, the average parent does that on their mm. planet. They say, no, you need to need me for the rest of your existence, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, otherwise I'm not going to validate you or validate your experience or so forth. But God doesn't do that. God says, no, you're allowed to have experience without me. And I'm going to make it so that when you catch up with your mate, the other half of you, that experience is so complete in itself yeah. that you're not going to need any other person to survive, to be happy, to enjoy life. Mm. You, you can actually be the only soul in the universe and still enjoy life mm -hmm. if that was your underlying choice. Mm. You know? mm. and, and God's made that ability in, in, built into us. So, so that's an indication of how much God cares for our happiness yeah. personally yeah. by, by making it to a point that that we don't need anything else to be happy. Yeah. 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 Incredible. Uh, God created a mechanism within each half of the soul, the conscience, which we've discussed, mm -hmm. that allows the human soul to receive truth from God directly without an intermediary. This indicates that God wants us to individually access the truth that God has and that he does not withhold truth to those who seek it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you think about the operation of the conscience itself, it's a direct communication link between God telling us how God feels about any matter and us receiving the truth about that matter. Now, mm -hmm. God could have done it differently. He could have made an intermediary me that, you know, you go to and you find out what God's truth about the matter is. Yeah. He could have done that. You know, yeah. that's the Christian philosophy of Jesus, really. Yes. Right? Yeah. So God could have done that, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. God, God could have also gone, well, you know, I'll just write a whole heap of books or whatever and, and yeah. give you all, all through that in a su progressive process, you know. Or you're going to have to, I'm going to teach just a few people the truth and then you're going to have to like find out from them and what the truth is you, yeah and if they are busy well you're gonna have to wait well, you have to wait. Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah he didn't do that either yeah. it, you know he doesn't you know what do humans do on earth when it comes to truth most of them are protective about truth they 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 say oh they're in a competition about truth mm -hmm. you know god doesn't do that either god doesn't mm -hmm. say i'm so great you're so bad <laughs> you know yeah i'm never going to give you all the truth because if it did uh, then that would mean that you're the same as me and i don't want you to be the same as me so you know god's not like that either yeah you know god, god is very generous when it comes to the sharing of truth but but the conscious mechanism is more than that if you think about mm. it it's actually a personal inbuilt mechanism that allows god to share personal truth mm -hmm. In other words, the truth about what you do mm. and what you say and mm. how you feel is all able to be shared through the conscious mechanism. Mm. Now, this aspect of the conscious mechanism is not about the universal truths. Mm. This is about the personal stuff that's going on in your personal life. God's able to share with you what his opinion are, is about those particular matters. Yeah, right? it's quite mind-blowing in yeah. itself, isn't it? Now, when you consider that, and you go, wow, that means that God knows what his personal opinion is about everything I'm doing in my personal life, yeah. and he wants to share it with me, and he built a mechanism to share it with me personally, and what he shares with me personally is different to what he shares with the next person. Mm. Right? It's different because they've got a different experience, different feelings, different life. Mm. Right? Mm. And so it's different. It's a personal experience. And, and God built that in. Mm. So, so how does he feel about the individual? The individual is pretty important to God. He, he's not trying to put all of us collectively, seven billion of us on the planet collectively and go, 
oh, you all do this, so I'm going to do that. Or most of you do this, so I'm going to say that. You know, no, he's more interested in the individual and going, no, I'm going to help you get from where you are now to a new place, a new growth. And I'm going to do individual things to help you do that. I'm going to give you individual advice. I'm going to help you individually. I'm going to assign an individual spirit to help you. I'm, you know, this is the things God does. So this is yeah. all indications of God's personal interest in the individual. Mm. Yeah, mm. very important to understand. Mm. Mm. God also created a mechanism within each half of the soul, which is longing which allows God to share his love with those who want to receive it. And this indicates that God wants to love and be loved by each of his children. Yeah, so, so the way God distributes love is like get, get the seven billion people together and just shower them with love. That's not how he wants to experience a relationship. Mm -hmm. He wants to have a relationship with the individual. So, so he's basically saying, no, I'm not going to get the seven billion of you and share my love. Although, aside, aside from those other ways. That well, he's done all that discussed. already. He's yes. already given us collectively his love, yes. as we've already discussed, yeah. by giving us all these collective things that mm. are all the same. Gifts, yeah. Gifts that are yeah. all the same. But he's saying, no, my personal relationship with you is, is between me and you. It's not between yeah. me and somebody else. Yeah. It's between me and you. There's no intermediary. There's mm. no go-between. There's no mediator. Yeah. We are... What we are going to be in a relationship is mm. what God's intention is. Mm. I want a relationship with all my children is mm -hmm. what God's intention is. Mm -hmm. so, so he wants a relationship with all of his children. So this is what he's saying to us. I want a relationship with you, mm -hmm. personally with you. You can bring me a lot more joy by having a relationship with me. Right? He's saying that. I'm not going to be devoid of joy if you decide to not have a relationship with me. But... I experience more joy when you do have a relationship with me, mm. right? And I want to know you and I want to know what you're feeling and your experiences. And I'm already doing all that. He's saying to us, I'm already doing all that. I already know you. I already know your experience. I'm already watching you. I'm already listening to you. I'm already engaged with you. Are you going to engage with me? Is what he's saying mm. to us. Mm. And, and he wouldn't do that if he was per not personally interested. Hmm. He wouldn't. He, he, instead, what he would do is he'd go, oh, you know, I'll just shower my love upon a lot of them. And those of them who want it can have it, and those who don't want it can throw it away. Hmm. Right? Hmm. That's not how it works with God and never will. Hmm. Right? The, the fact that he inbuilt a mechanism in the soul, the, the connection with the Holy Spirit, the longing that connects us with the Holy Spirit, is an indication. And he did it for both halves. So you can, one half can have it when the other half doesn't. So even the halves of the soul have these inbuilt mechanisms. And, and so her love can flow into one half of mm -hmm. the soul and not flow into the other half of the soul even, yeah. uh, particularly initially. Mm -hmm. That's often what happens. And God did it for the half, just, just to make sure that you've got two chances mm -hmm. of having the relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, your half and the other, per other half of you has the chance. And, and God would not have done all of those things without there being a lot of thought and consideration and a lot of desire for the personal relationship. Yeah. 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 Okay, God provides truth on an individual basis through the mechanism of the conscience. And this indicates that God wishes to have a personal experience with us and shares in the wonder of our discovery of truth. Yeah, so here we're talking again about this lovely emotion that we have when we discover truth, you know, like it is a wonderful emotion. And it's interesting, I find, that most people experience it when we talk about external truth, but very few experience it when they talk about internal truth. But if you can get into the habit of doing both, you know, yeah. external and internal truth, you, you sort of get into being constant wonder of what you learn, you know, mm. about yourself and about the universe around you. And, and God wants that to be a personal experience. So, so it's interesting. You can start to try to talk about it with another person, but it always loses a lot in translation, right? Mm -hmm. Either they have not been through the experience you have and so they, they don't understand the feeling you have, or they might have been through the experience, but because they're a different personality, they might have felt differently about the experience than you did. And this is what God's interested in. He wants, what, what is your experience? Yeah. How do you feel about this? So what's coming up in this conversation a lot is that the very fact of our individuality demonstrates that God is interested in us 
as individuals yeah. and and every experience the discovery of truth the um the desire for love all of those things god wishes to have an individual interaction with us about yes yes yeah. and he, he he would prefer and 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 always has the inter- individual reaction rather than the collective mm. now he is aware of what the collective does mm. But but he is interested in the personal. Yeah. So so God is also trying to help the collective mm-hmm. through all sorts of actions, but he is individual in the per- interested primarily in the individual mm-hmm. because he knows that the individuals are what make the in the end the collective choice. Yeah. So, so unless the individuals change, yeah. the collective choice can't change. Yes. So so God's not silly when it comes to all this. He's 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 well educated with regard to how things work. Yeah. And and as a result of that, he's interested in the individual relationship. The even the individual corrective process mm-hmm. he's interested in. Mm-hmm. He he has a plan for each of us individually to redeem us. Mm. So this person's gone and done that. Oh, now I'm going to have to do this. This is how God feels. And if you can connect with God, you can feel God feeling these things. This individual now went off and did this destructive thing. Now I'm going to have to have this particular mm-hmm. things uh, to help him in this particular way now because they did that particular thing. Yeah. You know, this is how God plans uh, it, to have a relationship with us, even when we don't have a relationship with him. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. is the way God thinks. And he does that for each of his children mm-hmm. individually. Mm-hmm. So, so it's like each child has this individual plan or structure for our redemption yeah Mm. yeah all right well and finally god provides love on an individual basis through the mechanism of longing and tailors the response to the individual condition Mm. this indicates that god wants a personal love-based interaction with each individual which is governed only by the desires of the individual Mm. So, you know, he could have made it so that, you know, oh, we get 20 people together and we pray for God's love, then we get it. But if there's not 20 people, then God doesn't give it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how demands on society are basically based. Mm. You know, if we think about society generally or even in a family, it's what the majority want that eventually happens, right? Uh, You know, and in society, it's usually what the majority want that eventually happens. The individual's not really can, can, you know, even connected with at all. Mm-hmm. And in fact, this is why, you know, in recent times, we often refer to as a number rather than a person, yeah. because uh, as an individual, we're not really considered it. It's the collective uh, and statistically, cl- you know, average that mm-hmm. we, that is connected to yeah. with regard to society, you know. Yeah. You know, we are fed things based on statistic averages, basically yeah. about oh, you went here and you did this and you went there and that, so this is how you must feel, type of thing. Yeah. And and there's a whole heap of presumptions made by society and parents and even our husbands and wives. There's mm-hmm. a whole heap of presumptions made about the opposite partner, about what their real feelings are that are mm-hmm. often not true. Mm-hmm. It's not like that with God. Mm-hmm. God knows your individual feeling. He knows what you feel, think. And, and why you do and take the actions you take. Mm-hmm. And, and he's concerned about when, he, when we receive love from God, he wants you to feel the love. He's mm. not, not, not somebody else. They, they can have the desire and then they will feel their love, you know, mm-hmm. as an individual reaction then. Mm-hmm. He's concerned about the individual relationship. Yeah, so yeah. all of this is evidence. Everything we've just discussed is evidence that God has feelings for us as an individual. Yeah. And God has a very personal love for us that is and and a, and a personal interest in us as a unique being. being. And and that God's personal interest in us exceeds his collect, interest in the collective. Yes. Yeah. So so you know he he actually does more with the personal than he does with the collective. Mm. You know, because there, there's a whole heap of things designed just for the personal, mm. um, well, which are, which can't be experienced as a collective. As a collective, yes, it's yeah. almost hard for me to relate to the collective feeling that God that, that right. God has yeah. for the collective. Yeah, it so seems so what we're saying is like the conscience is a personal mm. connection with you. God wants that personal mm. connection of sharing truth. The the longing based connection with the Holy Spirit is a personal connection with you, so that you can receive God's love. God didn't design that so that a collective gets together and experiences it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you know, this is where I, why people I, I often don't understand why I don't pray with them. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't pray with them because there's no such thing as a collective prayer experience. Mm-hmm. 
It's a personal experience we've got, mm -hmm. nothing more. Mm -hmm. Now, people can get together and, and have a sincere longing if they desire to have, and, and they might experience something collectively, but it, it will be individuals experiencing it, not yes. the entire collective. And if we rely on a collective to increase an individual desire, is yeah. that really an individual desire? Not really, no. It's, yeah. it's quite insincere. It can yeah. be. It can help, you know, to be encouraged or inspired mm -hmm. by a collective group. It certainly mm -hmm. does help. Or the environment may feel supportive of my desire, certainly. which might help me and to God's not, experience not against more. such support. Yep. But but to finish up relying on it for your own personal aspiration mm -hmm. is not a wise because yeah. God is responding to your personal aspiration, mm -hmm. not to the collective's aspiration. Yeah. So, you know, this, these are all the things God has done to, to um, show us that he is personally interested in us. He wants a personal relationship. Yeah. He is a personal God, mm -hmm. not, not just a, collect, a God of mm -hmm. all, all of us. Of course, he's God of all of us too. Yeah. He created all of us, but he wants the individual relationship, not just the collective relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Mm. Okay. How God feels about individual human choice. So now we want to refine our discussion even further. Mm -hmm. We've talked about how God feels about us as individuals yeah. and the love that God has for us as, as individuals. Now uh, I want to ask you about how God feels about the choices that we make. Mm. A lot of people feel like God isn't interested in my personal individual choices. Mm. Um, so does God have feelings and emotions about what we do or what I do personally as mm. an individual? Yes, uh, I suppose we could say this is a very similar discussion about how God feels about collective human choice mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, we need to probably go through a bit of a preamble about choices and how, what God knows about choices yeah. uh, in the same way that we did about looking at collective human choice. So, mm -hmm. so firstly, we can see that the section that covers how God feels about human individually, humans individually, mm -hmm applies to everything we would say here yes. as well. So, so the same things apply. But in extension of that, we need to focus our attention on this aspect of choice mm -hmm. and, and what goes on inside of God when we make choices mm -hmm. and, and how does God feel about choices we make. Mm -hmm. And God knows that individual choice is primarily supported by, again, our individual belief systems mm. that are either contrary to or in harmony with God's laws. Mm -hmm. And he also knows that our individual choices are also governed by our individual emotional condition, mm -hmm. either out of harmony or in harmony with God's laws. Mm -hmm. so, so, when, so God knows that the reasons why we make choices are, and, and he understands the reasons why human makes make choices. Mm -hmm. and. Of course, the fact that he gave us free will means that he gave us the ability to make choices. Mm -hmm. So God, firstly, is very, very happy that we make choices. In fact, God, God you could say, is um, most disappointed with us, mm -hmm. if, if you could use such a term, in the sense that God feels that, that it is wrong for us yeah. to not make choices. Yeah, so you could say the least happy <laughs> or something. Yes, yeah, so it's he, hard because we don't want to attribute to God emotions that God doesn't have. That's right, and God yeah. does not have an emotion of anger or rage or those kind or of emotions, or, dis even. or even disappointment yeah. in the sense of, uh, well, it depends how you evaluate disappointment. Mm -hmm. See, for many people, disappointment means a devaluation of of our value. Yeah. Uh, we're, God's, God doesn't devalue us. Mm -hmm. He just it feels that every time you decide to not make a decision, mm -hmm. it's bad for you. Yes. Yeah. So, so, of course, he, he's not happy about mm -hmm. the fact that you're trying to avoid making decisions. He uh, wants you to make a decision yeah. about something, yeah. you know, because decisions are better than no decisions mm -hmm. is the way God basically sees it. Mm -hmm. And and we need to learn to make decisions. That's yes. a part of activating our desire. And God wants us to activate our desire, yeah. not just act upon our current condition. Yeah. He wants to activate a desire, us to activate a desire for a new condition. So yes. he's extremely happy when we activate a desire for a different condition. Yeah. Yeah. And he also doesn't like at all the idea of us not making decisions. He created us to make decisions. And in fact, 
the laws that he created almost forced us to make daily decisions. And as we discussed in our assistance group, it's, it's basically impossible to not make decisions. We just mm. reduce the number, we, we, humans generally attempt to reduce the number of decisions they actually make, that's mm -hmm. all. God doesn't enjoy us doing that either. He thinks that's a bad choice. And, and whenever we make bad choices, he, he'll be in our conscience saying, it's a bad choice, mate. It's a mm -hmm. bad choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. This is not good for you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work out good for you doing this. You know, this is what God's going to be saying to us because he is interested in our happiness. He knows that our happiness can only result from us making decisions yeah. in harmony, particularly with love. But even making any decision is going to be better than making none. Yeah. So we need to learn to uh, make choices and decisions in harmony with love if we're going to have better outcomes in our life. Yes. And God's very interested in that. So, so God feels, a lot, again, a lot of pride, joy and contentment when he sees his children making decisions and particularly when he sees them making decisions in harmony with love that mm -hmm. are going to benefit them, make them happier individuals or even just decisions that are going to lead them to love. He, yeah. he, he, he's happier. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. then you're making a decision that doesn't lead you to love. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. So, for example, let's say you're in a relationship and it's a bad relationship and you, you're not going well, both of you are unhappy. He would prefer you make a decision to leave each other yeah. than he would to, for you to make a decision to stay in the relationship and remain unhappy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Of course, he'd pr probably prefer even better that would be that you stay in a relationship and be happy if that's yes. possible, yep. right? But of course, that's going to be dependent upon whether you're soulmates and a lot of other factors, of mm -hmm. course, which God already knows too. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, he would prefer to see you leave your relationship mm -hmm. than stay in it, even if you are happy, seemingly. <laughs> Yes, seemingly. Seemingly. Yes. Because he knows that he created a greater happiness for you once you get with your soulmate, yep. and then you'll be even more happy, right? Yeah. So, so, so God is always leading you to the most happy choice, mm -hmm. the one that's going to make you even more happy than you are now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right, and he and God, of course, shares in the happiness when He sees His children being happy. He's, he's he he feels a, a, a greater happiness within Himself, and of course. God's emotions are already infinitely experienced. So, mm. you know, there's this beautiful, infinite experience of his happiness already internally. But he, because the relationship now is possible and the, the child is now feeling the benefits of having a relationship with their other half, he's like, oh, you great. You've got together with your other half that I made for you and everything. So there's a lot of extra joy, of course, that comes from us recognizing our other half and experiencing our other half and coming to know our other half and understanding ourselves better and everything this just is it increases god's joy so so i want to clarify that because you've already said god's infinitely happy and then you say it's you can't increase on infinity can't but, you well i don't know it's sort uh, of like I now question. we're getting into philosophical argument about infinite and infinite being but but the reality is that God does feel the happy, feel happiness and even and experience more happiness the more happiness we experience. Yes. So, so you could say that there's a new quality to the happiness of God, would you say? Definitely. Or? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. And, I just and wanted to. It's a bit like if you, let's say you're a parent and you're a bit romantic, you know, and, and, and your child has lived alone for a lot and, you know, hasn't experienced much joy and all of a sudden he meets a person who, you know, it feels real good for you that this person is really lovely and, and, this, and, you've ha and your son's or daughter is now really extremely happy that they've met this person. Surely your happiness as a parent is going to increase. To see, to see or notice that your child's happiness has increased. And, and this is how God feels about us. He, 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 he feels that like this joy that we experience um, from the choices and decisions we make. Yes. And, and he yeah. loves the fact. Because remember, the joy we experience is like a gift to him that he doesn't have. Yes. You understand? I do. It's sort of like, and this is what we need to understand about our love and our joy and our happiness and our desires and everything. These are, these are gifts that we don't, that God doesn't have. And then when, when he notices a change in us, they are additions to him. Mm, right, mm. he doesn't have them because he made us an individual, mm. and therefore he made us that it, you have to decide to share it before it can be shared. Yeah, you know? 
Yeah. And and this is a beautiful thing that this individual part of you know, the individuality that God created. Remember, though, that God is outside of this universe, mm. and this is all happening inside of God. You you, you mm-hmm. could say it's like so so inside of the infinite being is the universe itself and all of us, and and here we are contained within this. But there are things going on in here that we can either try to avoid or mm-hmm. engage. But God feels the avoidance and God feels the engagement. And mm-hmm. what is God happier with? Mm. The avoidance or the engagement? Well, mm. once you feel God, you know that he's happier with the engagement. Mm-hmm. So he's happier when we love. He's happier when we take risks. Mm-hmm. He's happier. You know, he feels the happiness, of, our happiness of taking risks mm-hmm. and feels our happiness that we have when we love. Mm-hmm. And, and when we lock ourselves down and avoid our emotion, he feels that this is not good for us. And he will project that feeling at you if you and, and he, he will tell you through the conscience that feeling mm-hmm. whether you want to receive it or not he will put it there mm-hmm. and where, and it's your choice whether you receive it of course or mm-hmm. not but he will always give it he will always deliver that feeling mm. to us and there might sound to be some things about contra- contradictions between in, in having an infinite nature and then experiencing these things but you remember that in giving the creation, the pinnacle of his creation and individual experience mm. and self-responsibility and in giving them self uh, uh, an individuality and giving them uh, will, mm-hmm. he has precluded himself from certain experiences mm-hmm. that only can be experienced if we engage. Yeah. Right. And God enjoys those experiences. Yes. That's why he created it that way. Yes, because they're new experiences. That's what I was attempting well, for to us, highlight. They're new experiences, but yeah. they're also new experiences <laughs> within God's universe, aren't they? So God hasn't. Well, they're new experiences in in, in the sense that uh, in the sense that it's with you. That's what that, I mean. And, yeah. that, and that's what God wants it to yes. be with you. Yes. You know, like. No, you have never experienced that before. So therefore, yeah. so, your well, experience of it. Millions of others might have experienced mm. that already. Mm. He's still interested in the fact that you experience it. Yeah. It's like millions of other people have met the soulmates already. Yeah. But when you do, he's pretty happy about mm-hmm. it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it, it's not it, it's not like, oh, millions of others have, so now the joy is gone. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's interested in your individual experience yeah. and and having that having the feeling that comes that you didn't have come to him about your individual experience. Because mm. when you have, there are certain feelings that go to God that, that God cannot experience unless you send them to him mm. because by, he can't take them from you. He can't steal them from you. Mm-hmm. They have to be given. Yes. And, and this is the thing. It's the same with the desire to enter a, a relationship with love. Yeah. They have to be given to God in order for their relationship to be established. So it's very important to understand that the gift of giving it mm-hmm. to God enhances the joy that God experiences because he is precluded from experiencing that joy while you don't give it. Yes. Right? So while he's happy that he made you and happy that you're still making other choices and decisions and happy that you've a pinnacle of his creation and happy about all those things, he's not unhappy about any of that. Mm -hmm. His joy is definitely enhanced by the fact now that you have added to his joy, and this is an interesting concept, that we can add to the joy of an infinite being. Mm. Uh, that's a pretty interesting concept in mm. itself mm. Uh, and and something that we need to understand about mm. loving God mm. and also in embracing the experience he designed for us. Mm. Yeah. So it's quite really. uh, quite wonderful, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so you've said that God feels joy and happiness and pride and contentment when his children individually choose in harmony with love. You also mentioned that God just feels good when we choose something quite actively because that's that's us. Well, well, there's, uh, a, there's also this other aspect which is yeah. really important to understand, and that is God desires to have love flow. Like it, it, love is an energy in motion. It's mm. an emotion. It's energy in motion. Of course, God has a feeling of love for us, but it's not flowing into us while we deny the relationship, right? So, so... What is better, like imagine you love somebody, but they don't love you and they don't let your love in. How does that feel? Does that feel worse than when they open their heart and they let your love in? Of course it does. Of course. So, so this is how it feels for God. It's like when we open our heart and let God's love in, 
now there can be an enhanced experience between you and God. Mm. And there's an enhanced experience for God between you and God, mm. because now you're letting God's love in. The love is now flowing. The energy is in motion. Yes. So while God has an infinite amount of energy to flow, we are restricting the amount of energy that mm -hmm. flows. And of course, that impacts upon the way it feels for God. God would rather that we let it flow, Yeah. right? We will benefit from the flow. And it's the same on the receiving end. When we don't feel anything for God, there's nothing that flows from us back to God. Nothing mm. flows. It's a, it just is blocked. And so God can't experience your love, right? While God knows how you feel about everything, because you're not feeling love for God, God can't experience your love. God wants to. You are an individual being. Even though God created you, he created you to be an individual being. He cannot experience your love unless you allow him to, yeah. unless you want him to. Yeah. And these are ways that we enhance God's experience, right? Even though he's an infinite being within himself. Mm. This is why he created children, because it also enhances his own experience, because he's given the gift of free will to the individuals. And when they love him, they, he receives something that they, he has never received before. Yeah. And, and, and so it has a benefit to God as well. Of course, everything that God does has a multiple benefit to all of creation, yep. including God herself. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. All right. So God also loves to share truth about life with every one of us. Mm. It's tr And through this conscience mechanism that we've discussed a lot, each person can receive God's feelings about their choices. Yes. And God, God wants to make it easy for us to understand new truth. And, and you know, he, he, he often is looking down at us and going, wow, that experiment of yours took 50 years, you know. If you, if you had this relationship with me, it could have taken two minutes, you know, <laughs> like or, or, or a day, you yeah. know. Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> you know, what, what do you think God's, uh, how, God, how does God feel when we take 50 years when we could have taken a day? Well, I was obviously feeling like, why aren't you taking a day? You know, what, what, what's going on there? What, can we do something? And God is always trying to do something to help us take the shortest amount of time to do something so we can experience joy sooner. And that, that is what a loving person would do. They're always trying to help us experience our joy sooner. So these are all things that God is do, doing. And through the conscious mechanism, he's trying to help us get to the stage where we experience truth sooner so that we can experience love sooner right remember truth always comes before love so so we have to experience truth sooner before we can experience love sooner and and he wants us to do that he, he just desires that with us so again while he's an infinite being he cannot see the response in his children to the truth that he can share unless we receive that truth so we can lock off if you like his ability to um, to fully enjoy uh, the fact that he's delivered truth to us and we've received it. It's sort of like when you give a gift, isn't it? When I mean, you think about when you give a gift, you can give a gift to somebody and they go, oh, yeah, no worries. And, you know, th oops, throw it away. I better keep a couple of these things in and, and throw it away, right? So, you know, they can do that. Now I've got them all in your disorder. <laughs> so, no, no, you can, you can go, I'll, I'll sort of that. Um, so, you know, you can, we can just throw it away. And how does that feel when, when, you know, something that you spent time and effort and energy giving and, you've re and let's say you've really put some thought in it and it's not a selfish, you know, thing that you, you, you just bought for them what you really wanted for you or anything like that. But it was really a sincere effort put into it and you know the person would like it. You know it's going to benefit their life and so forth. It's a real sincere effort put into the gift only to find that the person gets the gift and doesn't value it, mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, when the person values it, what does it do with you? It increases your joy about the fact mm -hmm. of what you did. Mm -hmm. And of course, these are the kinds of emotions that God does experience, mm -hmm. an, an increase of the joys as a result of our personal choices. Yes, and I feel here it's important, though, to make the distinction because we have to be careful of anthropomorphizing <laughs> God here, <laughs> yes. um, in that when we draw those kind of analogies, how would I feel if I put all this effort into a gift and somebody threw it away? My response, given that I'm an injured individual who's not infinite, who, you know, doesn't have all this love, is going to be different from God's. 
But really the point that you're making there well, no, is... It's, it's only going to be different from God's if you have injuries. Yes. It, when you have no more injuries, when you give a gift, it's not you, your response isn't different from God's. It's just a smaller than God's, that's Ex all. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was just thinking for our listeners, it's, it's, you're more trying to draw, draw the comparison with the joy we would feel when a gift is valued rather than saying God must feel hurt, rejected, yeah, well, disappointed. Remember, God or, doesn't have any negative emotions yes, because... And, 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 and this is where we've got to be careful as well. Because we have negative emotions under certain circumstances, we then have a t tendency to attribute them to God. Yes, that's that's right. not the case at all. God, God's not hurt when we don't accept his gift. Mm -hmm. God doesn't feel disappointment or feel anger or feel like I'm not going to buy them another gift because they didn't appreciate my gift. Right? That's not how God is. But, but God does experience an enhanced joy when we receive it. Mm. Right? Because God can. And if you think about it, the, the blockage of reception means that a gift is given, but it, the energy isn't flowing. It's not entering the person. It's not changing. It's not causing a difference in their world. And God wants to cause a difference in your world, but only at your invitation. Right? And God is not offended that you don't invite him in because he doesn't have those emotions. But God is very happy when you do, because there's an enhanced experience for God in that process, as well as an enhanced experience for you. Mm. Mm. So it's really quite beautiful the way God sees everything, I feel. It is. Mm. Now we're up to page five. If yep, you I've got it. it. Yep, yep. okay. <laughs> um, okay. Where would you like to be on this page? <laughs> um, down near the bottom where we need to talk about how he doesn't share in the individual pain and suffering and so forth. And, you know, I feel yes. we need to, you know, focus our attention on the fact that he shares his joy, happiness and contentment with each child and who chooses in harmony with God's laws. But when we choose out of harmony with God's laws, it's not like he shares in our pain and suffering. He doesn't share in our pain and suffering. He observes our pain and suffering. He doesn't feel worse because we've chosen pain and suffering. He, he, he is happy because was, he remains happy because he knows that in the end, all of the decisions and choices we make have, can only be made because of the gift he's given us of our will. So, so he can't be unhappy about that. And how can you be unhappy about giving a being will and then you know, they go off and decide whatever they want to do with that will? Yeah. You can't be unhappy about that. So he's not unhappy about that. But but it does mean that he, that he is going to feel less from you. You are restricting his feelings from you. Right? And this is something that, you know, most people don't realize that we do have an impact on the infinite being because we can restrict our feelings from him. That is our choice. We're allowed to do that. God has given us this choice of restricting our feelings. And so God's allowed us to restrict our feelings and restrict our feelings from God. But of course, it's not going to feel good for us or God <laughs> as a result. Now, yeah. God doesn't feel bad about it. We may, but God doesn't feel bad about it. But he certainly would prefer that we don't restrict them. Yeah. He designed us to have a capacity for emotion and to feel. So it's, it's important that we understand that, you know, when we choose, he has compassion for the choices we make that are out of harmony with love. He's still very, but he's still very happy that he designed us in the way that he did so that we can make a choice. Even though he feels, if you, if you can feel through the conscious mechanism how he responds to that choice, he goes, this choice is not good for you. It's not good for the universe. It's not good for anything. But if you want to make it, you're allowed to make it. He, he's not going to go, I'm going to punish you for making it, make your life miserable for making it, and all those things that are normal, uh, you know, the average human parent would probably do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just like we discussed in the, um, you know, in the discussion about collective choice, God doesn't rescue us individually from our individual choices. He can't. Like, he, he gave us this beautiful gift of free will to make a choice. He's not going to rescue us from the choice mm -hmm. unless we want some rescuing from the choice. Right? When you say rescue, though, you don't mean to take away the consequences of the choices. Um, no, he can even he can help take away the consequences of the choices, but only 
at our, with our involvement through the process of forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. He, he can't rescue us from our choice without our involvement mm -hmm. he, and, our, and, and without our desire. Yeah, hum humility and... Exactly. So, so he, he, can't, he can't say, oh, you've made a terrible choice and you're in a terrible amount of pain and suffering, but I'm going to rescue from it even though you don't want rescuing from it. It's a bit like uh, any person who's ever helped, uh, say, a person who's a drunkard on earth, would, would understand this under, un, underlying principle, and that is it's impossible to rescue somebody from something they want to continue doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though it's harming them, right? You, 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 they need to fill the bottom, generally, of their behaviour before they can actually be engage in a rescue process, and the rescue process has to be by their desire. Right? That's the only way to really help a person. So. So unless we get into a state where we want to be rescued, God cannot rescue us from <laughs> our decisions or choices. Yeah. When we get into a state where we want to be, now God can help with our decisions and choices and also help with the pain and suffering that flows from the consequences because the forgiveness process that God engages with us allows love to enter and also work upon the causes of, of why we chose to do what we chose to do or mm. why others chose to do what they chose to do. Mm. All right. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, so God desires that each human comes to these internal realizations when their choices have been destructive, just the same as God desires us to do that individually when we make collective choices that have been destructive. So, so a lot of what we're saying now does apply to both collective choices and individual choices. But we need to understand that the feelings God has about us individually making a choice are individual feelings that God has. So. When I make a choice that's in a certain direction and somebody else makes a choice in a different direction, God feels my choice for my personal direction and God feels their choice for their personal direction as individual feelings. God is capable of feeling billions of feelings, like an infinite number of feelings, in fact, at the same time. Mm. So he can feel from one child one negative feeling while he's feeling from another child a positive feeling. Uh, mm. and. He can feel from one child a feeling, or for one child, a feeling of, no, you're making the wrong decision now. And for another child, a feeling, you're making a great decision now. You know, <laughs> this is going to be real good for you and, and good for others too, you know, good for others of my children too. So God's able to make these things simultaneously, constantly, without limit. And this is the nature of God, you know. Yeah. God still requires us to be personally responsible for our choices and decisions. So, so he's not going to take away personal responsibility, mm -hmm. and, and particularly when we've not learnt anything from the personal you know, choices and decisions that we've made. Mm -hmm. we, all must, we always must learn something from the choice and decision we've made. And, and even if we engage the process of forgiveness and repentance, he's not going to take away the learning lessons because the learning lessons are everything. So this is what he w wants to do with us individually. So it's a, just a beautiful thing, again, I feel, with regard to what God does about the individual human choice, is that he's demonstrating constantly he's interested in your choice. He wants to know what your choices are going to be. He's like to, he'd like to assist you with your personal choices. He'd like you to be open to your conscience mechanism so he can assist you to make the choices that are wise and, and loving and ethical and moral. And when you don't, he's willing to tell you. He's willing to say, yeah, that's a bad choice, mate. You know, that's not going to, you, you're my child, but that's a bad choice you're making there. And mm -hmm. it's going to have some disastrous consequences for you in your life. And he's willing to even provide warnings for you. Look, if you do that, this law is going to interact with that and that's going to cause this and it's going to be bad for you. He's, he's willing to help you understand all of that as well. Mm -hmm. and, but he, and he does that individually. He's not, it's not like collective. It's, he's not like saying, the 500 people over there who are making this choice, this all applies to you. Mm. That's not how he works. Mm. He's saying to every one of those individuals 500 times, mm -hmm. this is a choice that you're making and it's not going to work for you and this is why. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we need to understand that God is very concerned and desires involvement in our choices, but he does not, he is not going to tell us what to do. Yep. He's not going to tell us what to do. The reason why he's not going to tell us what to do is because he wants us to decide for ourselves what to do. Yeah. He created free thinking individual beings. Mm. He wants us to understand how to use our will. Mm. He wants us to understand our choices and the impact that they have. Mm. He's not going to tell us what to do. 
Yeah. He can provide advice, he can provide warning, but he is not going to tell us what to do. It is still our choice mm. and we need to understand that. And that in itself demonstrates his love for us individually too, yes. if you think about it. Yes, because certainly. Because it means that we're allowed to make the decision we want to make. Yeah, 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 yeah. So God has specific feelings and emotions about what we do as an individual. Yes, mm. yeah. So in this whole section, we can see God has feelings, emotions. God has feelings, emotions collect about collective choices. God has feelings, emotions about individual choices. God has feelings and emotions about us humans collectively, about his whole, all of his children. And then he has individual feelings and emotions about us as individuals. And if we can, we can see all of that, we can go, wow, this means that not only is God this infinitely experiencing feeling being, but God is also intensely interested in my personal welfare mm. and and this can help us greatly with the forgiveness and repentance process mm. because if we understand that god's intensely interested in my personal welfare when i don't forgive god knows the impact it's going to have upon my life and my and 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 how it's going to harm my life and so god wants to help us go through that process and and when we and when we don't repent god knows the impact that's going to have on our life the, the inexorable operation of the of the law of compensation grinding us into smithereens basically mm. is what's going to happen as an alternative and god knows that and god wants us god wants us to prevent that process from happening because he's interested in our welfare <laughs> he cares about how how long it takes for you to be happy right and and we need to appreciate that in order to start opening up to the concept, but it's time that instead of doing everything without God, it's time that we started try, uh, attempting at least to have the relationship so that we can start doing things with him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Pete. <laughs>